Hello and welcome to this special bonus episode of The Dairy Edge. Chagas are running a weekly Let's Talk Dairy webinar series, which is also being made available as a podcast. On this week's webinar, Stuart Childs discusses the factors that affect milk fat percentage. Um, so this morning, and in light of uh, just a question that was asked last week, um, I'm just going to do a little bit in relation to milk butter fats, and it's actually probably quite appropriate um, because it was very well described to me by a farmer last week at a group that I was at um, that April was a long, slow pull, is how he described it. So April has been a tricky month. Um, good weather conditions, obviously, but the, the weather hasn't been, or the weather has been in our favour, but the, in terms of graze outs and so forth like that. But um, we didn't, with the exception of Easter Sunday, which was obviously quite a wet day in the south in particular, um, we just haven't had great growth and uh, you'll be, those of you that will be getting the, the grass 10 update will know that there's fantastic growth figures being forecast for this week. Um, I suppose not necessarily hugely ahead of time, but definitely in light of the slow level, slower levels of growth that have been there all along, we would um, we would be, I, I would say across the country, we would be quite glad that there's been an uplifting growth coming uh, after coming. And it's come very quickly. And I suppose that, presents its own challenges in, in many ways, <clears throat> but it also may feed into a small bit of a, a, an issue, potentially short, very short-lived probably with rapid growth um, in relation to milk butter fats. So as, uh, as I said, this just came up as a question last week and it's something that we probably haven't covered with a while maybe, so it's, I just said it was worth maybe taking a look at. And I would suggest um, that if people have any queries or want any particular topics covered by all means, uh, email me, and we'll do our best to cover uh, issues that may be of concern to you, because that's the idea of this part of this uh, webinar. So I just uh, share my screen there now. Um, okay, so basically, uh, I, I'll go into the mechanics of it in a minute in terms of how it works. Uh, but in relation to milk fat percentage, a huge problem that we have would be generally associated with the potential of a firm to produce milk fat and the genetic side of things is very very key and I would have mentioned this last week um, I suppose in general again just a very general summary I would see a lot of farms uh, that have PDs for protein and fat of in or around 0 0.1 0 0.12 so ranging there from 0 0.08 up to 0 0.12 and um, point, the 0 0.08 being kind of the protein figure and maybe up to 0 0.1 0 0.12 sometimes a little less for the fat figure and what this table is showing here is in, in relation to that genetic merit, where like anal analysis, uh, analysis, sorry, of um, a large amount of data that's been gathered, so milk records, uh, milk recordings, obviously, etc., and collating that with the PD for fat within the herd uh, has allowed us to create kind of this table here, which will tell you what you can expect your protein or sorry, your, your fat to be, your annualized fat to be basically um in relation to what your pd is for fat so uh, as you're aware i'm operating down here in moor park and obviously in a an area that was significantly affected by quota down through the years in the dairy gold area in particular i suppose uh, and there would have been an emphasis away from butter fat because there was what will be very unfamiliar to a lot of the younger people was a butter fat coefficient which actually reduced your allowance in terms of liters that you could supply. So if you had a high butter fat, it actually hampered you in terms of the number of liters you were supplying. And as a result, people would have bred cows more towards protein than they would have towards fat. And that has, has had its consequences of resulting in lower levels of fat, I suppose, in herds than what would have actually been possible, I suppose, if we didn't have a quarter situation. People would have uh, been more balanced in the approach that they would have taken. I suppose another factor that would have influenced the, the breeding decisions around butter fat is that there was a period of time there when, where science would have suggested that butter was bad um, and there was probably less of an inclination to pay for that and as a result uh, the value on butter fat in milk was lower uh, and again um, further research or revised research I suppose has shown that butter is actually good for, uh, is, is a healthier choice, maybe even possibly healthier than the margarine that was been suggested in advance uh, in the previous time. Uh, and there's now an emphasis or greater emphasis in terms of pricing towards butter. And most people will have seen at some stage that your co-ops have adjusted the payment scale 
to give a little bit more for the butter fat because it's of a higher value to them uh, now than it was in the past. So there, that's, I suppose, the context of wh where our breeding decisions have gone. I suppose what it also emphasizes is that our breeding decisions, which are now taking place and probably maybe the horses bolted in relation to it for 2022 uh, dis breeding decisions. But um, that if we strive to get high fats and look, I would believe that the advice that we've been given down through the last uh, couple of weeks in particular in relation to breeding should be pushing people towards higher butter fats and higher proteins in terms of their PDs. And that will result in better situations in relation to fat percentages in, into the future. What this does say, uh, there, there's a very raw, rough rule of thumb, I suppose, is that the, if you deduct 0.4 from this, it gives you the lowest point that you're going to go to or that you would expect to go to um, at this period of time where butter fat does tend to move around a little bit. So if we take our point ones, as I said, which are generally very, very roughly, there's no science behind this figure, but just looking at um, at the ICBF reports or the EBI reports for farms that I'd be on doing discussion groups, as I said, we generally sit in or around that point one, point one two figure for the most part. Uh, crossbred herds tend to have higher figures and herds that have put a focus on breeding for bottle fat over the last number of years are also tending to have higher figures. So if you're sitting at a 0.1% uh, genetic merit, or sorry, 0.1 for PD uh, genetic merit for your butter fat, then it is possible that your butter fat could drop as low as 3.55 uh, on some of your tests from your co-op. Um, and people get very concerned about this uh, in terms of, and, and we'll see it in a minute in relation to acidosis and, and risk of animals getting sick, et cetera. And, in reality, I suppose uh, it, it is a real concern in a housing situation, and we'll come to it in a second. It's probably a lot lesser of a concern in a grazing situation, but that's not to say that we ignore it either. Uh, I suppose the other thing is to point out that we now see young stock coming through that have milk fats that are up around 0 0.15, 0 0.18 kind of figures, and you can see that that's obviously moving the dial upwards in relation to the annual fat percentage and again if we apply our rough rule of thumb at 0.4 that means that we're not going to go lower than 3.77 in, in this situation and it, look it can be transitory enough to that drop in milk fat um, and we come to the factors involved in a minute but the it it does be it generally is always a cause for concern for a period of time um, probably more so in April in normal years, I would say, but I think uh, it seems to have been be a little bit later, and I've seen it a bit in the last week or 10 days, that people are saying that their butter fats are dropping below the 4%, having been quite strong all along. Probably as a factor of maybe supplementation in terms of maybe bits of, of, of silage still in the diet for a period there up until a couple of weeks ago because of uh, low growth rates and trying to keep the gap filled. Um, and maybe just grass not growing as rapidly uh, would mean that the grass wouldn't be uh, changing the way it normally would change. And as I said, the rapid growth that we're encountering now, it may be a cause um, of uh, maybe a cause and a solution. And you'll see why in a second in terms of the butter fats over the next number of weeks. So obviously breeding for butter fat, we'll say if we can get up into the point twos, we're going to be at that kind of 4.3, 4.4 mark. That means we're not going to drop below four at any stage or very likely to, or un, unlikely to drop below four. Or if we do, it'll just be a, a very short dip below four. And the other thing is that strong genetic potential. If we moved out, as we move back down the table here and we move into the realms of the zero for fat or, or maybe even negative or even just a slight positive for fat, that can drop obviously there to 3.33 potentially or 3.28 um, here in this situation. And that's obviously quite low and that impacts on milk price. And what we also see is where those herds have weak genetics for fat, um, they actually stay quite low for quite a period of time. And some herds can run for maybe up to a month or six weeks at very low fat levels. Uh, and then they, start, they kind of seem to adapt again, I suppose, and start to recover again. So that's the genetic side of it, I suppose. Uh, milk fat at grass, obviously, the percentage piece of grass is a is it a concern? There's always an, uh, this worry, I suppose, that we're talking about grazing nice lush covers of grass or good quality covers of grass to to try and drive milk protein percentage, and there's concern around the fibre content of it. 
If we look at the, the house, fully housed system, you can see that there's, look, there's going to be high levels of concentrate being fed, maybe five, six, maybe even more kilos of ration being fed in that kind of situation. Depending on the, the format of that ration, it could be very high in starch. Uh, and the NDF of, of the whole diet may potentially drop below 30% in that situation. Um, you'll have low unsaturated fats uh, and low milk fat. And then there is a genuine acidosis risk in that situation if your NDF has dropped below 30%. So your NDF is your neutral detergent for fiber. So it's your measure of fiber content in the diet. So I suppose it's, it's, it's logical, I suppose, and if we put it in the context of a human person, uh, of a human being, it's like, uh, taking in huge quantities of of something a very rich food basically and sickening yourself as a result of it and that's what we're doing we're feeding high levels of concentrate in that situation which is very high in starch very readily broken down um, and that obviously creates an acid load within the stomach or within the rumen and the rumen isn't able to deal with it uh, if it's overloaded with acid and it actually damages the papillae of the rumen. So the absorption of nutrient is even compromised and caused and gets gory as a result of it as well. Then we flip over to the grass situation, which is our common situation in Ireland. And I suppose what we get here is a small bit of a carryover effect in terms of the what happens in a great in a house situation being translated uh, incorrectly into what's happening at a great on a grazing situation. We have a very high level of forage in the diet in, in these situations, even if we are feeding four or five kilos of meal, we're still up on uh, 65, 70 percent of our diet, maybe. Uh, and in, if we're feeding two to three kilos of meal, we're closer to maybe 85, 90 percent of the diet now being fed uh, as forage. The level of starch isn't very high because we should be, generally speaking, on kind of uh, high fiber type ingredients, high energy uh, in our rations unless we're feeding very high levels of starch in that, which could cause possible problems. Um, that there is the possible high unsaturated lipid, and that's that's associated with rapid growth. And, and I spoke, I would have mentioned it last week in terms of um, just how the profile, fatty acid profile of grass changes uh, just as we move into second round in particular. But as I said, I feel that there's a the potential that this is, there's a leg phase there this year because the way growth has been, and that we're now looking at more, that could potentially be a risk uh, for the next couple of days the on the flip side of it is i suppose with that rapid growth we're actually going to end up with potentially grass getting too strong very quickly which means our fiber content is going to increase which will maybe change the or keep that fiber level high in in the diet even though it's not really a concern in the first place um but but also it could impact in terms of that the the fat changes might be just that little bit more short-lived in terms of low milk fats in those situations, it's actually pass it's it's more driven by uh, high unsaturated lipid in the diet rather than uh, low milk fat being as a result of an acidosis, which will be the case on our fully housed high starch, high concentrate diet. And um, so I suppose it's not it, not to rule out acidosis. It is a, it is something that people need to be conscious of. I suppose and look individual cows could potentially uh, get acidosis if they got uh, maybe if they were eating too much ration if the ration is wrong as i said it should be high in digestible fiber uh, type nut that you're feeding now rather than high um starch type ingredients that you would be on when you have silage in the diet um but the the, the actual risk of acidosis and it, look we talk well, there's often talk of bubbles and dung etc being a sign of acidosis um it doesn't it doesn't seem to manifest itself and as i said there's some work being done on it currently. Feeding trials have been done here in in Moor Park to look at look at it from a dietary point of view uh, to see are, are there consequences of rumen for rumen health in relation to it. Uh, just I suppose to follow on then in how how is this manifesting itself? So what what's what's happening here? So fat in the cow's diet, lush green forage being digested here. We have our fiber digestion taking place. We've our unsaturated fats being converted to CLA, which go to help um milk fat production uh, and we have our saturated fats which are going into milk fat building blocks which then come back into the other in the form of milk fat as well so where we have that adjustment or change to the uh, the fatty acid profile so as i said here possibility of high unsaturated lipid so that's just the fatty acid profile of grass changing as as the growth habit of it changes i suppose uh, that level of of unsaturated fat increases 
uh, and the CLA level as a result, uh, which is conjugated linoleic acid, which is an omega-6 uh, fatty acid, which is actually quite good for people. And the Food Research Center here up the, up the, the road from me would have a huge amount of work and research done into the benefits, the health benefits for human beings in relation to uh, conjugated linoleic acid and its uh, role to play in human health. So it's not necessarily a bad thing, but I suppose it's a bad thing from the point of view of farmers that it's, it could potentially be dropping a milk price. So that CLA then obviously uh, it, it goes into milk fat, uh, which is what the Food Research Center is looking at, but it does cause that milk fat reduction in dairy cows. Uh, and as I said, the genetic side of it will dictate how long the, that impact is. But the last slide was actually um, just a graph showing where cows were fed the same diet across the board. The only change being that CLA was actually added into the diet uh, of one group and versus the control, uh, the feeding of the CLA dropped milk fat as low as 3.0% 3 3, 3 and 3.1% um, with no effect on rumen health. Um, and then when it was removed, uh, the diet, they went back to normal and, and aligned with the control group again. So it just emphasizes that it's probably it, it in most, in the vast majority of cases where we see a milk fat drop in uh, grazing herds, it's been driven by the adjustment or the change in the fatty acid profile of the grass that's growing uh, and isn't really, isn't for the most part going to be driven by an acidosis effect. Uh, I suppose we're, we are dealing with a product that's uh, relatively low dry matter, I suppose, if we compare it to silage, which we will be trying to get up into the 25 to 30 percent, maybe even higher for bale silage. So um, we do have a certain amount more water of in, in grazing diets, obviously. Um, so that does probably contribute to the fact that cows are that bit looser at grass. But again, the, the key thing to point out here is that room and health isn't impacted uh, in that situation. And that's very important for people because you could go running off uh, doing lots of things. And look, I, I often recommend it to people that uh, if they are concerned about acidosis, a bale of hay available somewhere on the way in or on the way out, I suppose on the way out is more convenient from the, the collecting yard or from milking uh, will allow cows to get extra fiber if there is concern about the fiber levels that they're consuming. Uh, and you will, uh, nine times out of 10, I have seen that, that will, the cows will pick away at, uh, at the bale of hay as they're passing it, they might take a mouthful of hay, but nine times out of 10, that bale of hay will still be there um, for, or, will, or will survive for, for want of a better way of describing it for quite a long period of time because the fiber content of the diet at the, in the grazing situation on that farm is not actually an issue at all for those cows. And the cows are able to self-regulate their fiber intake. Uh, so they, they will look for fiber sources. So they will maybe graze rougher gra grass out of ditches, et cetera, if they are lacking in fiber. Um, and that's why they will approach the hay and get the hay if they need the, the extra fiber. And the fact that it's left behind in a lot of cases is indicative that the fiber content of the diet is not the concern, and that's actually the fatty acid profile is the major issue. So that's uh, that's the summary, I suppose, to sum it up. So uh, fat percentage is going to be affected by the genetic potential of the herd. It's also going to be impacted on the, the, the fatty acid profile of the grass, which there is very little you can do about it uh, that we're aware of currently anyway, in terms of Maybe there is possibility that there's some breeding stuff that could be done in relation to the cultivars that have been used, but there isn't a huge amount happening in relation to that that I'm aware of at the moment. Um, the the, uh, the potential to alleviate that fat drop uh, in terms of the severity of it and the length of it is, is very strongly driven by genetics. Uh, and we can look at that um, and try to build on that. And it is actually something that can be adjusted and addressed very quickly. If you look at the figures that are available for a lot of the bulls that are available now, you can see butter fat isn't actually that hard to try to dramatically improve it because uh, you could quite often get um, uh, bulls that are easily 0.2 plus uh, maybe 0.3 even for butter fat. So um, it's quite easy to move the dial in relation to that quite quickly. Uh, and then the final thing, I suppose, is that uh, while we while that rumen or that butter fat drop may uh, be an indication of acidosis, the vast majority of times uh, in grazing situations in Ireland, it's not. A, it's a it's a reflection of the fatty acid profile of the grass rather than an issue with rumen health. If you are concerned about it. 
uh, as I said, you can put the, give the, the cows the option of taking some hay or straw. Um, and the likelihood is in the vast majority of cases that they're not going to take a huge amount of either because it won't be compromised in terms of their fiber digestion, uh, the diet that they're on. So we'll leave it at that for today. And uh, next week, we're going to talk a little bit about dairy beef, uh, just to emphasize the importance of choosing good sires for dairy farmers from both the point of view of calving ease, but also from the type of stock that's going to be generated and the potential for those to mature into high quality beef animals for the farmers that are taking them through to slaughter. Uh, so we'll be addressing that topic next week. Uh, and I've just had another suggestion in there. So thanks to that person that's uh, dropped in a suggestion there in relation to a topic for covering in the next number of weeks. And I will come to that. Uh, and thank you for the suggestions. And as I said, by all means, please do email me some suggestions. I'm more than happy to try and cover topics that you want to hear. I try to have a good handle on what people want to know about at uh, any given time of the year, but that uh, I may not always be on the money. So if you can drop me a line at, at stuart.childs at chagas.ie, um, I'll be happy to try to address the concerns that may be coming in. I won't promise to address them all, but I will try to address them if I can. So thanks for tuning in this morning and apologies for a little bit of a delay there to start getting on, getting going. Uh, thanks for waiting. Uh, wish you all well for the week and talk to you next week. Thank you. That's all for this week's Let's Talk Dairy webinar series. And don't forget to look out for more bonus episodes each week. I'll be back with our usual Dairy Edge interview on Monday, so do listen in then. I'm Emma-Louise Coffey and thanks for listening.